Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. I hope the week has gone well. Let me start with Northman Trader, who's become cryptic, uh, tweeted, I feel good. Just click on that link, it's on rich wrap ups, it's rather good. Um, I quoted him in my article on the 11th of November, the markets are run by machines, computers, algorithms and bots. Home thoughts, this is Gauguin's Ari Matamo, the Royal End in the National Gallery, which has a big Gauguin exhibition. There's a superb book about him by Mario Vargas Lasa, which I've also read. But this particular painting, The Royal End, in the early days, in his early days on the island, the Tahitian king Pomare V died, and the French takeover of the island appeared to be complete. This moment inspired him to paint Ari Matamo, The Royal End. Gauguin's aim was not to literally portray the king or to document the event, but rather he created a kind of fantastic and macabre pastiche that referenced both the loss of the local leader and the sense of mystery that the island setting had sparked in his imagination. What appears to be a severed head rests on a white presentation cloth spread over a food platter, its eyes and mouth remaining hauntingly open and suggesting some kind of enduring quasi-live presence. Figures in the background show their grief through gestures, all within a highly colourful and patterned interior, inspired by sources ranging from Marquesan sculpture to Persian carpets. It's really remarkably uh, arresting. Wants to impress, mystify and unsettle the French viewer. Imran Garda tweeted, as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. That, of course, is the wonderful Nelson Mandela. Um, this is a photograph of a kingfisher by Misakiti. Um, and that took me back to Hallison days from the Latin Alcyone, daughter of Julius and the wife of Seeks. When her husband died in a shipwreck, Alcyone threw herself into the sea, whereupon the gods transformed them both into Hallison birds, which are kingfishers. Um, it really is a great story today. The word is used to donate a denote a past period that is being remembered for being happy and all successful halcyon days. At the moment of vision, the eyes see nothing. The moment of vision is in essence a non-linear thing. It's a moment of deep insight. William Steele won the We Are Wilderness, Africa's Plants and Insects macro cat category. This is from the Safari Rich Water Photograph. During the wet season, there is a scurry of activity as the smaller insect make use of the soft soil. Dung beetles are out in force, searching for and moulding dung into perfect spheres. The People's Choice overall winner in the We Are Wilderness photo competition is this lone oryx climbing the steep dunes in the Namib Nakluft Desert to catch the cooling moist air blowing in from the ocean. It is named Travelling on the Edge and taken by Prince Eliezer. And finally, African Stars at Night Imagine sitting on your deck in the middle of the Okavango Delta and looking up, and what a night sky that is. Nancy Pelosi, who I think the world of, 
invoking the founder's declaration of independence from an oppressive monarch as she lays out next steps for the impeachment of Trump. 21st of October, I said POTUS is currently undergoing an impeachment process at the hands of nervous Nancy Pelosi, his moniker, which probably is a linguistic transference of a sort because I think she makes him very nervous. Don't mess with me, Nancy Pelosi blasts reporter who asked if she hates Trump. You've just got to watch that. Um, and she's asked the House Judiciary Committee to proceed with drafting impeachment articles against President Trump. The two sides to this coin, one is the, the actual charge, uh, the charge sheet, the legal threshold. I think all those have been met. The other side is the political angle and it will take uh, a lot of Republicans to switch sides and Trump with his Twitter handle has got them in a Pavlovian, got them under Pavlovian level control. KCNA Trump, that must really be diagnosed as the relapse of the dotage of a dotard. North Korean official comments on Trump, if any language and expression stoking the atmosphere of confrontation are used once again on purpose at a crucial moment as now, that must really be diagnosed as the relapse of the dotage of a dotard. <coughs> they don't mince their words. I've written about North Korea several times. Last time was in Pyeongchang. I called it a significant and iconic moment for the Mount Pektu bloodline, and he's been popping up to Mount Pektu twice now on his white charger. Um, and then I was writing about events on the 30th of April when optimism was at its peak, and new history starts now, an age of peace from the starting point of history. Um, and then, of course, that incredible optics geopolitical optics of 12 jogging bodyguards escorting Kim Jong-un's limo. The Food and Agricultural Organization Food Price Index reached a 26-month high in November. World food prices surge in November, <coughs> lifted by meat, vegetable oils. Big jumps in prices of meat and vegetable oils despite slightly lower cereals prices, the UN FAO said on Thursday. Uh, measures monthly changes for a basket of cereals, oil seeds, dairy products, meat and sugar. This index hit a 26-month high in November, up 2.7% on the previous month and up 9.5% year on year. Vegetable oil price index rose 10.4%, reaching its highest point since May 2018. Meat price index registered its largest month-on-month -month increase since May 2009, rising 4.6% from October. Uh, beef and sheep meat rising most strongly, lifted by demand from China and year-end holiday demand. This is not a good moment for this to be happening. I've wrote, written about the fragility of the world in that article, The New Economy of Anger. I said that phenomenon is spreading like wildfire in large part because of the tinder dry conditions underfoot. And I was saying prolonged standoffs eviscerate economies, reducing opportunities and accelerate the negative feedback loop. And I had not factored in food prices, but you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know high food prices tend to trigger further turmoil. A lot of people thought the Arab Spring, well, the catalyst for that was food. Um, very interesting article that Gary Kasparov has written in, on CNN. Reality was whatever the party put out on the nightly news or in the official newspapers, Pravda, which means truth, and Izvestia, which means news. As the joke went, there is no news in the truth and no truth in the news. 
denying reality became too grave an insult to our dignity, an underestimated ingredient in the spirit of revolution, he writes. Critical reports are fake news. Journalists reporting the facts are enemies of the people. The phrase from Vladimir Lenin's debunked conspiracy theories is repeated and public servants testifying under oath about documented events are dismissed as never Trumpers. The internet was supposed to shine the light of truth into every corner of the world, breaking the authoritarian's monopoly on information, but it has also become a light speed delivery system of lies and propaganda. The web has been chopped into pieces like a shattered mirror. Each fragment reflects a different distorted image instead of a single reality. Software's power and US companies betray the values of the nation that enable their success by doing the bidding of dictators. It's really hard hitting. And I take you back to what I wrote in December 2016, quoting Don DeLillo, the specialist is monitoring data on his mission console when a voice breaks in. Then I was quoting Beppe Grillo, this is the deflagration of an epoch. It's the apocalypse of this information system, of the TVs, of the big newspapers, of the intellectuals, of the journalists, he said. And indeed, I think what he said was quite powerful. He's right, I said, traditional media has been disrupted and the insurgents can broadcast live and over the top. We have a deviate, is that article, that link is on rich wrap-ups. Turkey sees the entirety of northern Syria as an area it wants to either control directly or use proxy forces to control foreign policy. It now runs areas around Afrin, Idlib, Jarabulus, Tal, Tal Abyad. This is an unprecedented expansion of Ankara's power, not seen since the Ottoman Empire, which is the vital point. Get Brexit done. It's not as simple as Boris Johnson claims. As in 2017, this was meant to be a Brexit election. Also, as in 2017, it has quickly morphed into one about the National Health Service, security and terrorism. Yet, the pithiest slogan of the campaign is still Boris's much repeated promise to get Brexit done. And although his poll lead has narrowed, the odds are that this pledge will help bring him victory. The question is, what then? With a Tory majority, Parliament seems sure to ratify the Article 50 withdrawal agreement that Mr Johnson renegotiated in October in time for Britain to leave the European Union by January the 31st. And then they conclude, and it's a very interesting article in The Economist, in transition Britain will be in a form of vassalage. And this is why, when I was writing about this election on the 18th of November, I quoted Lord Alfred Tennyson, the Lotus Eaters, because not only are they making promises that are patently false, you know, it's quite incredible on both sides. There is sweet music here that softer falls than petals from blown roses on the grass or night dews on still waters between walls. The US has imposed sanctions on Russia-based evil corporation for malicious cyber activity. This headline sounds straight out of a comic book, said Chi Girl, indeed, sanctioning 17 people, six other entities linked to evil corp, says a statement on the US Treasury website. Let's move on to the currency markets, uh, Euro dollar 110. Uh, 111.07, that's had a grind higher. Dollar index grind lower, 97.395. Japanese yen, 108.61. Swiss franc, 0.9880. The pound, of course, has been on a roll, popping above 130, now at 
Australian dollar soft, uh, much to my chagrin, 0.6841. I was hoping it would be above 69 by now, but I think we're headed there. It's the fires, which are pretty apocalyptic, according to the photographs I've seen. India rupee 71.339, a lot of disappointment yesterday that they didn't cut interest rates. South Korean won 1189.56. Brazilian real 4.186, Egyptian pound 16.1393, and the rand 14.6368. This is a dollar index chart from FX Pip Titan. I expect further weakness. Euro dollar, um, I think, is headed higher, um, currently trading 111.07, and I'm expecting it to trade up to at least 111.60. China's birth rate <clears throat> is at a six-decade low, but now has the world's largest pet, cat, and dog population. Chinese pet owners are on track to spend $29 billion on their furry friends this year. That's up 19% year-on-year. On a sunny mid-October afternoon, Leia spent her third birthday munching a gourmet three-course meal of chicken, beef with salmon, and a yogurt-based cake atop a rooftop restaurant in Beijing. Lea is a German miniature pincher and one of millions of pets in China whose every whim are indulged by their owners. Spending on pets in China is accelerating despite a broader trend of slowing retail sales growth in the world's second largest economy. Perhaps exacerbated by a growing trend of singlehood and childlessness, urban pet owners are on track to spend $28.6 billion on their pets this year, 19% more than 2018, according to a study by Gumin.com, a Chinese social network for pet owners. China's falling birth rate is matched by its mounting pet club. The Asian nation now has the world's largest dog and cat population of 188 million and surpassed the US in pet numbers in 2018. Almost half of dogs and cats adopted in urban areas this year have been by Chinese born in the 1990s and 88% of caretakers, that's surprising, are women, according to Gumin.com. About half of pet owners they studied across China's major cities are single and 9 out of 10 said they consider their pets on par with children or family members. China's birth rate fell to 15 million babies last year, the lowest in six decades. This is the photograph of the dressed up dog at the Pet Fair Asia 2019 in Shanghai. This is interesting, something I did not know when I wrote my article on the 7th of October, China turning 70. SoftBank WeWork debacle is a dot-com bubble deja vu, says Holger. And have a look at the chart, the boom and the bust and the dot-com and then the rally back. And now where are we headed? A lot of folks made bad bets during the internet's early days, but SoftBank's misses were outsized. As the bubble burst, shares lost almost all of their value from 2000 to 2002, reflecting a paper loss of more than $70 billion for some. Commodity markets Saudi Aramco to lead elite $1 trillion plus club after IPO. <coughs> IPO valued the company at $1.7 trillion, which trailed Mohammed bin Salman's hope for $2 trillion valuation, but it gives the Saudi Arabian behemoth about a $600 billion lead on Apple and Microsoft, the only other two companies in the world worth more than a trillion dollars. Um, price its IPO at 32 rials per share at the top of the 30 to 32 range, valuing it at $1.7 trillion, raised $25.6 um, from the IPO, the biggest amount in history. Total bids were 119 billion. Look, I thought it was a good outcome. I thought two trillion was very frothy. The shares are in strong hands and retail. They're going to hold on to it. Um, sovereign wealth funds from the region who are part of the geopolitical Arab NATO in most cases. Um, and therefore, I think they did quite well. 
Glencore under investigation for bribery by UK authorities. Shares fall as much as 8.6% to a three-year low. Glencore is being investigated for bribery by UK authorities, deepening the legal troubles that threaten the world's biggest commodities trader. The shares fell as much as 8.6% to a three-year low. The SFO cast a wide net, saying it's looking into suspicions of bribery by the company, its employees, agents and associated persons. For Glencore, the investigations have raised fundamental questions about how the business of commodities trading is conducted around the world. It's more of the same, but now it's getting attacked from a different angle, said Hunter Hilco, a London-based analyst at Investec. Glencore was already trading at a discount because of the Department of Justice, but when this news comes out, it gets whacked again. Bloomberg reported last year that the agency was preparing to open an investigation into Glencore and its work with Israeli billionaire Dan Gertler. I was in Kinshasa earlier this year and having a smoke early in the morning and suddenly this enormous contingent arrives at the hotel and he's in the middle of it and we had a little chat. Um, but when this news comes out, it gets whacked again. So uh, Israeli billionaire Dan Gertler, former Democratic uh, Republic of Congo President Joseph Kabila. Gertler and Kabila have been implicated in previous British and American bribery investigations. The US imposed sanctions on Gertler in 2017, saying he'd used his friendship with Kabila to corruptly build his fortune. Glencore is being investigated by the US Department of Justice. Um, and Brazilian authorities in the car wash scandal. The company has also been subpoenaed by the Justice Department for documents relating to possible corruption and money laundering in Nigeria, the De Democratic Republic of Congo and Venezuela. WTI crude oil has been pretty strong on the rebound, $58.31 right now. Got as high as 59 I think, or just below. Gold 1474 trading. Um, I've written about the pork apocalypse, which speaks to a very fragile food situation in China. Then we looked at the uh, man underscore integrated analysis about uh, protein, but uh, we've learned China is to exempt US soybeans and pork from tariffs. The bigger the better in emerging market equities as the market here, yeah. as you can see from uh, this particular uh, analysis. Sub-Saharan Africa, Zambia has defaulted again on its 97 million euro loan from Italian bank Intesa San Paolo for the purchase of two C-27J twin-engined military transport aircraft from Italy's Leonardo, reports Africa Confidential. As I wrote on the 14th of October and previously, the canary in the coal mine is Zambia. States of expectation, other nations are queuing up to state their claims to self-government in the wake of the Sidama referendum result. This is Africa uh, confidential. As I said when I was talking about him winning the Nobel Prize, Prime Minister Abiy faces a fiendishly complicated task fending off the centripetal forces which are tearing Ethiopia apart. Uh, Congo millions die while the UN keeps the peace is really a hard-hitting article. In its most recent report, the UN Security Council, the UN Stabilization Mission and the DR Congo, Monusco blandly recounted progress in service to their mission. But what is their mission? Up until 2013, Monusco had no combat mandate. They were somehow expected to keep the peace amidst a war uh, for Congo's resources without one. In 2013, however, as the M23 militia was ravaging North and South Kivu provinces, the UN group of experts on the DR Congo reported that M23 answered to the command of Rwandan Defence Minister James Kabarebe who, of course, answered to Rwandan President Paul Kagame himself. There were competing factions within M23, and some of its officers answered to high-level officials in Uganda, who, of course, answered to Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni. 
This made Rwanda and Uganda's wars of aggression so obvious that the UN Security Council finally felt obliged to do what the UN Charter compels them to, organize a UN military intervention to stop the Rwandan and Ugandan militias. The UN Force Intervention Brigade, composed of Tanzanian, South African and Malawian troops, was the first UN peacekeeping mission with an explicit combat mandate and they did indeed chase M23 back into Rwanda and Uganda. Violence has continued in the DRC's Kivu provinces, according to the Congo Research Group based at New York University. At least 99 Congolese civilians have been massacred since November 5 in North Kivu's Beni territory alone. With 18,000 troops, the UN peacekeeping mission in Congo is the largest in the world and it has been in Congo for 20 years without protecting the people of the peace. A young protester in Beni told Al Jazeera, the UN is supposed to keep us safe, to keep peace in North Kivu, but we've never seen the peace. So we're so angry, we don't want them to stay here in North Kivu. If we think about the UN and its presence, we need to go back almost 59 years that the UN has been working in the Congo because there were problems in the country. And I think that if we take that into perspective, we can of course question the utility of this organization because what we have seen in the last 20 years now is that people are still dying and this war that is happening in the Congo has caused already more than 8 million deaths. So maybe the response that the UN is giving to that situation is not an appropriate one. Sadly, he said, it's one more failed intervention. The UN has failed the Congolese people from the very first day of Congo's independence 59 years ago. So long as the UN Security Council and the press blame the war on non-existent rebels and rebel groups carrying out non-existent rebellions, the Congolese Holocaust will go on. NGOs and UN agencies will continue to call for millions of dollars to help with the humanitarian crisis, comparing it to Syria, Yemen and Iraq, and the displaced population already numbering 4 million will continue to rise. Neither the UNSC nor anyone else is going to defeat rebels or end a war they refuse to name. This is smoke from the United Nations Monusco compound rising in Beni, DR Congo, Monday, November the 25th, AP. Desert locust swarm reported in Galmuduk, central Somalia, Somalia, devouring pasture fields. This is a video by travelers capturing the swarm. Yesterday there was a huge number of butterflies and at first I worried that there were these locusts, but there were actually beautiful butterflies of all kinds. <coughs> Proposed changes in South Africa's constitution to allow land to be expropriated without payment will be officially published next week, according to Reuters. I don't think that's going to be helpful. South African oil shares up 3.87% year to date, dollar rand. The rand is holding in there 14.63, but that range that's been pertaining for a very long time is 14.50. To 1550 so we're right up near the top of the range and we've been sitting here for a couple of weeks egyptian pound 16.14 egx 30 up 4.5 percent here to date moody's investor services changes the outlook on nigeria's ratings to negative from stable the negative outlook reflects Moody's view of increasing risks to the government's fiscal strength and external position. Already, weak government finances will likely weaken further, given an extremely narrow revenue base and persistently sluggish growth that hinders fiscal consolidation. As pressures mount, there is a risk that the government resorts to increasingly opaque and costly options to finance a moderate but rising debt burden. Vulnerability to an adverse change in capital flows is building in light of Nigeria's increasing reliance on foreign investors to fund the country's foreign exchange reserves. It's a complete hocus-pocus way of going about things. 
Moody's decision to affirm the rating at B2 recognizes a combination of credit strengths, including the country's large and diversified economy, notwithstanding persistent credit weaknesses such as its very weak institutions and governance framework, and in particular, poor public finance management. Rationale for the negative outlook, Nigeria's public finances are increasingly fragile in a sluggish growth environment. In general, Moody's expects real GDP to remain weak at just over 2% over the next few years. The economy is yet to fully recover from the oil price shock of 2015 and the subsequent recession in 2016. Real growth remains below population growth, as it does in South Africa denoting an erosion in incomes from already low levels. While still at moderate levels, debt has accumulated quickly over the last four years, almost tripling to an estimated Nigerian 33 trillion, 23.2% of GDP in 2019, from 12.6 trillion or 13.2% in 2015. The stock of certificates, this is the interesting point, has grown very quickly to reach 17.4 trillion naira in September 2019 from 5 trillion in 2017, of which around 5.8 trillion, $16 billion, are currently held by foreign investors. In order to attract foreign investors, the CBN is paying high interest rates on these certificates. The policy is very costly and with consequent impact on the yields of other government financing instruments. Now look at this from Nonso 2, the Moody's downgrade in two graphs. Look at the second graph and strip out uh, um, uh, these uh, uh, certificates and you see that how much of an erosion there actually has been in FX reserves. Nigerian all shares down 14.37%. Ghana's SEDI heads for its 25th straight annual drop against the dollar. Wow. Um, uh, depreciation against the dollars, the government's fiscal challenges erode investor confidence in the currency of the world's second biggest cocoa producer. The SEBI is down 13% so far in 2019, according to data compiled by Bloomberg, poised for its worst decline since 2015, when it slumped 18%. Investors are concerned the government won't stick to spending targets. As a gets closer to an election next year, according to Cobus de Hart. We have an election coming up next year. Portfolio investors are concerned that the plan outlined in the 2020 budget will not be met because revenue continues to underperform. Gross reserves around $8 billion for some time now would suggest the central bank has not aggressively intervened to support the currency, which is a good thing. The new SEDI worth 1.2 original SEDIs and about half a British pound was introduced in 1967. Decades of high inflation led to a re-denomination in 2007 when the new SEDI was phased out and replaced by the current currency at a ratio of 1 to 10,000. It has since lost about 80% of its value. And this is the problem in Africa, that currency values just keep on collapsing. Ghana Stock Exchange is down 13.49%. This is so tragic. This is a clip that Nelson Chamisa posted of Stephen Sacker's BBC Hard Talk Zimbabwe uh, program. You've got to watch it in full. It's just amazing. I mean, I keep talking about tipping points and about Zimbabwe. It just beggars belief what's going on there. It's just shocking. Emerson Manangagwa, who was eulogizing Mugabe as, as a revolutionary icon, is a complete failure. And his frank is untenable as his mente. It's just shocking. The, here we've had a lot of drama. The DPP ordered the arrest of the governor of Nairobi, Mike Sonko, he of the Pate after Pate, and various other extraordinary and uh, mind boggling uh, short video clips he's been producing. One is the work is done, and he's sitting at the table of about 80. He has a fondness for. I think it's not Gucci, Versace. Building shaky bridges, its contents are underwhelming. Africa Confidential, the BBI report, failed to deliver on the hype and looks set to produce more ethnic rivalry in the run-up to the 2022 elections. That's Africa Confidential. Kenya doubles down on debt with $3.5 billion road bonds planned. 
Kenya will issue bonds of as much as 360 billion shillings, 3.54 billion dollars, to help to develop roads and repair an infrastructure network neglected from years of running a budget deficit. The plan comes amid growing concerns that Kenya is accumulating more loans than it may afford. The problem here is really the return on our investments, which are pathetic, to be frank. And the roads ministry, where each road apparently costs $10 million per kilometre, which is ridiculous. Um, I, I, I wouldn't lend them a shilling on this particular programme. Notwithstanding the fact that they're looking to do a revenue-backed bond offering the national government an off-balance sheet solution that will not have an impact on debt sustainability. Um, the agency collected 72 billion shillings in the year through June from a road maintenance fuel levy of 18 shillings per litre of gasoline and diesel. Safaricom issued a public notice position statement on Mali, which is the savings product they've launched, Safaricom trades on a P ratio of 18.639 and has a market capitalization of $11.59 billion. Equity Bank gained 0.48% to close at 52.25 cents shy of a 52 week high. Market cap $1.93 billion, um, P ratio of 9.9. .9. That's a buy purely on a Pan-African play basis. Nation Media uh, down 43.5% year to date, market capitalization $71.2 million. It is a Schumpeter level moment in this industry, I admit, but really they haven't been that competent themselves. Nairobi all share up 13.16% year to date, and the NSE 20 down 7.58% year to date. And with that, I wish you a great weekend.